All right, good morning and happy Monday. Welcome back to another episode of Patrista Cast. I'm your host, John Solhide, and today I am very delighted to welcome a couple of guests. One is returning guest from about a year ago, uh, two years ago. Yeah, two years ago, Peter. And then uh, Dr. Samuel Fernandez, professor, of faculty, uh, professor in the Faculty of Theology at the Pontifical Catholic University of Santiago, Chile. Samuel, welcome. And Peter sure. Martins, professor of early Christianity at St. Louis University in St. Louis, Missouri. Now, Peter, as I was mentioning, you were here on this uh, almost two years ago to the day. And uh, I I looked at that and uh, I remember I was sick as a dog in that episode. I think it had like 101 degree temperature. And if you look at me, I, I looked like I was hung over or something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was not feeling well. <laughs> Well, ho hopefully today's a, a happier conversation and we all, yeah, do well today. It is a, uh -huh. it is a happier conversation. So, Peter, welcome back. And Samuel Thank Fernandez, you. welcome to your first time on PatristaCast. Thank you. So today um, we are going to talk about what I think is one of the most fascinating and important texts, certainly in the history of the Christian tradition, and that is origins on first principles, uh, periarchon in Greek and uh, de principiis in Latin. And I have invited two scholars who have worked extensively on this text. Peter, you have an article coming out, you said, in the Journal of Late Antiquity pretty soon. And Samuel, you uh, have a recent critical edition in Spanish that has just been published. Peter's got it right there. So I figured, you know what, there's no two better people to bring on the show to talk about this text than Peter and Samuel. So uh, so let's get started, shall we? Uh, first, let's lay down some of the historical groundwork here. Um, on first principles, generally thought to have been written during Origen's period in Alexandria uh, for all things being equal, around the year 230-ish seems to be a typical date. Um, what What is this text? What Peter, you, in this article you've got coming out, you've got some ideas about why Origen composed it. Uh, lead us through some of that. What What's going on here with this text? Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, late 220s, 230. Um, the height of his tensions with his bishop. Origen is going to shortly thereafter move up to Caesarea Maritima. Uh, scholars have puzzled a lot about the structure of the work. Mm -hmm. uh, but why Origen wrote it in the first place is a question that we haven't had a lot of conversation about. And maybe that's because Origen says so clearly in the preface, <clears throat> he wants to refute the heterodox. Mm -hmm. He has the rule of faith here as a criterion. And he wants to explore um, things that were left unsaid by the apostles. And so the two R's stand out as the rationale for the work, refutation and research. And as I was thinking about the work over the last few years, I thought, you know, this doesn't quite seem right to me. Um, the larger context is Origen has a number of commentary projects that are underway. So he has commentaries on Genesis, on the Psalms, and on John. And these are multi-volume, large-scale works. And in On First Principles, he repeatedly turns you to those works. He says, you know, here's a verse we're discussing now, but if you want a fuller discussion, please see what I just wrote. Or he anticipates, he said, be patient, I'm going to get to this issue in the commentary a little way down the road. And so he's constantly referring you to these other ongoing projects. And it makes me wonder, well, why, why would you stop those or at least divert energy away from them to write this treatise? The argument that refutation and research is what this is primarily about um, is puzzling to me when we look at these other commentaries. Because Origen is refuting Valentinian, Basilides, Marcionic positions repeatedly in them. 
The commentaries are great vehicles for challenging the heretics. Mm -hmm. And the commentaries are a great vehicle for doing his own research. So why do we need to stop that to write on first principles? And so those are the suspicions that were sort of gathering in my mind. And the argument I am making, and readers can assess it for themselves, is that Origen is actually on the defensive. What has happened is Origen has put out views in these commentaries on the biblical text that have gotten him into hot water. His stances on the incorporeality of God, the value of symbolic interpretation, the resurrection of the human body, um, the monarchian issue, which is swirling around in several circles, especially in Rome, that Origen is taking stances that are clearly minority stances within his community of believers. I'm not talking about shadowy heterodox people now. Within the community of people he would regard as fellow believers, he's taking minority views, and many of his views are challenging the positions of bishops. Callistus in Rome, uh, Melito of Sardis, and Origen has gotten into enough hot water that he needs to defend himself. How do I argue for this? I, my argument is that when we look at the preface to On First Principles, there are clues. And one of the biggest clues to me is uh, how he exaggerates his church credentials. So what do I mean? Um, in the preface, I work from Butterworth's translation. That's just my copy. He talks about how there were many among the Greeks and barbarians who promised truth, but Origen gave up seeking for truth from them and turned to the scriptures. On the surface, that makes sense. Origen writes commentaries on biblical books. He doesn't write commentaries on Plato's dialogues. But we also know from Origen's curricula in Alexandria and Caesarea Maritima that he taught the philosopher's texts. And we know from later on in On First Principles where he quotes from Plato's, I think it's the Theotetus, he quotes from Plato and he completely endorses the quote. So clearly truth can be found in the philosophical tradition for Origen. Um, he draws a very sharp line in the preface between the heterodox and his own views, which are buttressed by the rule of faith. But when we turn to the commentary on John, which is already underway, he's happy to talk about Heraklion. He's not sure whether Heraklion's a Valentinian or not. He's on the fence about it. Um, but Origen never brings the rule of faith to bear in the commentary. He doesn't wag his finger and say, Heraklion, you're violating the rule of faith. He takes Heraklion on a case-by-case -case basis. Here's an interpretation which Origen doesn't like. Here's one he's not so sure about. And here's one that he actually likes. He takes a scholarly he, approach in the commentaries. Yeah, Scott, a growth mindset, very open. And uh, when you read the preface to On First Principles, you get the impression that Origen doesn't want anything to do with the heterodox, and he's just going to hammer them with the rule of faith. But we know from the other writings he doesn't do this. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say exaggerating or oversimplifying his church credentials. Mm -hmm. He also, in the span of a very few lines, uses words, um, ecclesia, apostolicus, traditio, and, and how he is loyal to the church's traditions. He's loyal to the apostolic traditions. And this too gives me pause. Why would someone who's been working in his church for over two decades, enjoying the privilege of his bishop to do this, why does he need to say any of this? <laughs> why does he have to tell his audience, oh, by the way, um, I support the uh, the apostolic teaching of the church. Um, Pierre Nautin, many years ago, put out a very interesting thesis. I think it's in a footnote where he says, you know, it was widely understood that bishops were responsible for preserving the apostolic tradition. Mm -hmm. And this could be Origen's deft way of signaling his allegiance to his bishop. We're on the same team. Mm -hmm. We're on the same team. But the fact that Origen needs to say it so explicitly... Um, so, makes me wonder. And so my reading of the preface to On First Principles suggests that Origen is an author on the defense. 
And when we look at the rest of his treatise, we see him coming back to these issues which got him into hot water. The incorporeality of God, resurrection, symbolic interpretation of the law and prophets, the fall of souls, um, the monarchian issue. They, they come up over and over and over again, but often in a more diplomatic way than in his earlier works. So I, I've i spoken, I think, a little bit too long, but I wanted to sort of get out what my argument is and, and what I think is motivating the treatise. Less a triumphant, let's destroy the heretics and do research, and more a, I've got problems. I need to shore up my positions and I'm going to use the rule of faith to shore up my stance. I'm going to hide behind this document and I'm going to show where everything I'm saying either supports it or follows from it. Very interesting. Samuel, do you have any uh, <clears throat> responses there? Well, I am hearing for the first time this uh, the uh, Peter's theory, and I think that is it is very inspiring. Um my my idea is well first of all that uh, on first principle is um, is a work that was not intended to to circulate uh, broadly that is it was like notes for the inner circle of uh, of the students of origin um, and uh, but well what what uh, peter said about the the defense i think is very very inspiring um on the one hand this stress in the in the apostolic uh, rule of faith is very strong uh, and on the other hand uh, when origin says well this is the rule of faith but is also saying well the other things are not and then he's like distinguishing between what is what you should believe if you are christian but uh, he also stressed the fact that there is a, a a, a, a huge a field in which you can uh, make research because there is no uh, clear statement by the by the um, by the apostles. Um, in this in this sense, I, I think that uh, the the idea of Peter makes sense. Um, and on the other hand, I think that the one of the aims of the on first principle is like a missionary aim that is um i think that we have to to be attentive to the concrete addressees of origin and possibly the addressees of origin uh, of the on first principle are a uh, greek educated people who was uh, interested in christianity but maybe they were very uh, uh, attracted by by gnostics and then um in my view, the main uh, aim of the of, of on first principle is to show that Christian faith, that is the Catholic Christian faith in the ancient uh, meaning of the word, uh, was rational, was sensible, was not uh, uh, something uh, senseless as the fides simplicorum, the fides, the, the the faith of the simples, um, and then. Um, he tries to show the rational of Christian faith without going with the Gnostics. And then these people who, who saw Gnost the Gnostic solution more rational, more philosophical than the simple faith, uh, have origin. And origin says, no, the, the, the right interpretation of the ecclesiastical faith is something that is possible to be subject of investigation, subject of research, that is su uh, subject of rational investigation. And then, um, for example, if we remember some statement of Celsus, this, uh, well, a Christian says, believe or go away, that is simple faith without reason. Uh, Origen says, no, uh, here we can research we can uh, uh, perform um, a rational re research on the scripture uh, without going to the, like, uh, on the one hand, the philosophical way of Gnostics, and on the other ha hand, the, uh, so to say, the fideistic jump of the, of the simple faith. And then um, 
And, and, and then I think that this aim is what shape, shapes the, the structure of the, of the treaties. That is, I think that there is a, a lot about pedagogy in the sense that uh, you have go you have to go step by step uh, convincing the the auditorium that this is something uh, sensible and then you can go on uh, with the with the research this is more or less my 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 view but i think that many problems of the structure of the of the text um have their source in the fact that this was not a, a book that was intended to be published and to circulate broadly, but mm -hmm. it was more like uh, the, the big picture, the big structure that the students of origin should have in mind in order to be able to put together all the material that comes from the commentaries. So, okay. <clears throat> My reading it, at least as I've been thinking about it more recently, is more aligned with Samuel's description here. But Peter, I think you are, I think you bring up a very fascinating point, in, especially in the preface. Origin seems to be on the defensive. Um, and it is interesting that he really hammers home this point with the rule of faith. Uh, that he doesn't tend to do in his other works. That has really given me something to think about here, because if you're thinking about the topics that he brings up in the text, they all relate to these theological topics with which he has found himself in hot water. The defensiveness, and I see you've got the uh, Munster coffee cup there, the Origeniana uh, Tertia Decima coffee cup there. There you go. There's the Renaissance origin. <clears throat> um, on the other hand, the way I've been thinking about this, because we know, for example, both of you have brought this up, that Origen taught. He he had a school, however, it kind of conceptualizing this institution, both in Alexandria and Caesarea Maritima, very difficult. But we know that he taught students. And in uh, Gregius Amaturgus' address of Thanksgiving, which he delivered after leaving or at the point where he was leaving the school in Caesarea um, several years after Origen composed on first principles, he outlines elements of the curricula. And there you've got the traditional topics of um, uh, uh, arithmetic, geometry, uh, physics, ethics, metaphysics, all these different topics which you'd expect to see in a philosophical classroom. I I can't help but see that as present in On First Principles. And something that got me thinking about this was talking to Christian Hengstermann, who's done some work on origin um, quite a bit. He, when he references On First Principles, he'll reference them with the titles of each section, you know. So like if he's going to talk about um uh book three you know he calls it on self-determination you know and i i think i can't remember what he calls um uh book one if he does does he call it um on physics or i can't remember what it is but uh -huh. it got pardon yep no oh, that's okay yep i i i can't help but think that these are all that this text fits very well with this pedagogical program, as as Samuel was saying, um, for students. I don't know about the the bit where uh, not designed for publication. One of the difficulties I think with um, comparing on first principles to some of his other works is that in the preface, there's no talk of Ambrose, who who became later, you know, his patron, and sort of um, underwrote all of his activities and helped fund the publishing enterprise. It, he's not present there. It could be that he hadn't met Ambrose yet at that time. Um, but it also could mean that these were lectures not meant for uh, wide distribution. I don't know. Um, but these are these are two 
I think these are the big questions with asking what was Origin up to in 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 doing on first principles, which I think you two guys are are kind of representing in this conversation here. Yeah, I, so I, I don't think that you know what Samuel said and what I said are these are not mutually contradictory mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> answers. They different facets of what's going on. Yeah, the I think what is striking and, and Samuel mentioned this. I think. Origen is very clever in how he talks about the rule of faith. Mm -hmm. He says there are things that are necessary mm -hmm. and they are expressed clearly. And that this is when we want to talk about heresy and orthodoxy, it's the necessary and clear things that the apostle said. That's where heresy belongs. Mm -hmm. But then there are all these things the apostles don't talk about, the hows and whys. And this is where Origen thinks his project can fit in. And so in many ways, he sees the apostles, he frames the apostles as licensing exploration. Mm. That's really important. Right. Um, so yeah, the rule of faith gives you a criterion for measuring what someone says, whether it's right or not, but it the rule of faith isn't comprehensive in scope. It doesn't touch certain questions. So um, in Pamphilus's apology, he quotes from Origins, I think it's the commentary on Titus, where Origen talks about the soul and its origin, and says, look, this is an issue the apostles don't legislate on clearly, therefore it's not an issue of orthodoxy and heresy. And that's a really important passage, because you can tell an author is being put under pressure. And his response is to say, look, the rule of faith isn't as big as you think it is. It doesn't talk about everything that you think matters. And so there are areas where I, as an advanced researcher, as someone who wants to provide an alternative to a Gnostic vision of Christianity, there is a space for me to work. And so, I, but I think that distinction he makes in the preface he, he belabors that point. There's the clear part of the rule, and then there's all the stuff that's not said. And when he then goes and lists the articles in the rule, he tells you what the clear part is. And then he says, and here are all the things we don't know <laughs> about that article. And, and that's precisely where he likes to spend his time. It's in the stuff we don't know. Um. And so I think that distinction, and Samuel alerted us to it, is extremely important. He not It's a way of not only restricting the scope of the orthodox heresy conversation, and it licenses his own exploration. Um, and it's, it's quite clear that he wants to create a scaffolding from which he can work and which he can push back against the simpler Christians, um, but also create an alternative to other Christian theologies that are floating around Alexandria at the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, let me say something, because uh, I, I remember a text that uh, somehow supports uh, Peter's uh, idea. Rufinus, when, when Rufinus, more than 100 years later, uh, was criticized because of his... Uh, uh, well, his translation of origin and so on, uh, he wrote uh, an apology to Pope uh, Anastasius. And he said, uh, regarding anthropology, I uh, support exactly what the church support. That is, that the soul and the body comes from God. Nothing else. And then uh, with the, the same idea of the, of the preface of, of on first principle, he can also defend himself. That is, I uh, I stick with the with the rule of faith and preexistence, the origin of the soul, and so on. These are discussed topics. These are not defined. And then this is uh, interesting because even more than hundred years ago, uh, that is later, uh, Rufinus uses the same uh, the same structure to defend himself. That is, I uh, I am faithful to the rule of faith and the complicated issues are not defined. Um, the other thing is that even, for example, in the fourth century, all the Aryan crisis could be understood in the light of the preface of, on first principle, because uh, in the preface, Origen says, about the son, we have, th that is the apostles taught that 
the son comes from that is was born from the father before creation and nothing else and how he came out from the father this is not something that the apostle taught and then there is room for the eternal uh, eternal uh, begetting there is a, a room for many different theories that is uh, for example arius and alexander could uh, say that they are faithful to this rule of faith. Uh? And then there is a pedagogical issue, which is very interesting. And the, the, regarding the, the pedagogy of, uh, on first principle, I wish to, to point out something that I think that not always is uh, well understood. Because uh, especially in the 20th, uh, in the 20th century, uh, many scholars thought that since origin presented some problematic issues and sometimes with questions, and it is not clear which theory is uh, was uh, uh, its own, or or for example regarding the the resurrection of the body. Finally, we have the the annihilation of the mat of matter or purification of matter and so on and then uh, many scholars in the 20th century they thought that this was like a strategy and when you have these problematic issues you have to think that the more shocking uh, theory is the theory of origin himself and strategically he present both theories and in order to to not be being criticized by by the bishops but uh, i think that if we take into account the concrete addressees of origin sometimes uh, things are upside down in the sense that for the addressees of origin what was shocking was the resurrection of the of, of the of the body and then um, origin present well maybe there is a, a final annihilation destruction of matter or maybe there is a purification and transformation and so on and then uh, between these two theories the the um, the concrete addressees were shocked with the uh, purification and transformation of uh, matter because they they come from uh, from a Greek educated environment in which the resurrection of the body was something shocking. And then I think that sometimes we can uh, turn the, 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 the argumentation and think that the, the origin's own theory is the more, so to say, biblical and ecclesiastical and not the more shocking and non-ecclesiastical uh, as the... 20th century uh, scholars thought. Well, I think this might be an opportune time to talk about why it's so difficult to read and interpret this text. And one of those is, um, you know, it's reception history has itself been mired in controversy. Uh, Rufinus and Jerome, for example. Um, and that plays out in some of the critical editions of this text, as more modern scholars have tried to reconstruct it and present it in a way that's coherent for modern readers. So perhaps we can talk a little bit about the, uh, the critical editions um, what they are, what they tried to do, um, what were some of the theories going into it to help us understand, I think, a little bit better why um, so it, these questions continue to bother or to, uh, I guess, maybe not bother, maybe that's the wrong word. These are questions that origin scholars continue to address or they, they feel the need to continue to address them. So, um, Samuel, you, uh, you published... Uh, one of the more recent critical editions in Spanish. Um, tell us a little bit about it. What um, what was your approach to doing a critical edition? And what did you find when you looked at the, the history of editions here? What What's going on with some of this stuff? Mm. 
Well, uh, first of all, something uh, more, more personal. Um, for me, it was very, very, very interesting and very funny uh, at some point that uh, we scholars, we think that we are neutral and we are trying to, to make a piece of uh, scholarship, a scientific scholarship and so on. But at some point, I understood that we today, we scholars, we are we make part of this chain of readers of on first principle and we are against or in favor of origin and it is not possible to go into the on first principle in a neutral way because if you are neutral be before origin if you if for you origin means nothing you don't spend a lot of time reading and translating and so on and then uh, the the first point is that there is no neutral uh, scholarship on origin because the the whole history of reception is um, against pro or contra origin and the second thing is uh, it is very interesting because here we have the the text the very textual tradition uh, was marked by by these two different uh, attitude towards origin. That is, we have Rufinus and the Philokalia um, that should present in, in a positive way origin. And we have uh, Justinian and Jerome who wants to show the, that origin was a heretic. And then the very textual tradition is marked by this pro and contra origin. And then the, <clears throat> my my first idea was simply to ask uh, Sus Chrétien for the for the um, uh, for the text and make the the Spanish translation. But when I went uh, into the the text, I I realized that the fragments in the Sus Chrétien edition are in a second volume, and then somehow there are there are there they are hide hide it from from the reader. Oh. And then um, I think that it's very important to have both in the same page to, to give the, the reader the chance to choose between the Greek and Latin when you have both. No? Oh. And then this was one of the, 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 the aims of the of my 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 edition. I remember. Well, I I studied with with Manlio Simonetti, and he once told in a in a class that for him was was more difficult to translate into Italian the on first principle. Uh, he translated in 1968 or something like that. Then to 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 make the text for the Soskretian edition because the text is uh, Simonetti's and Cruzel. It made the French translation and the notes, because he said that when you are translating, you you should choose between the fragments or Rufinus, and you have to to take uh, an option in, in these difficult uh, passages. Instead, when you are uh, uh, making the edition, you just can put the texts, no? and then I think that uh, every Every edition of on first principle is like an uh, implies some options. There is no neutral way to deal with this complicated text, and uh, I think that put all the material there is uh, the more uh, sensible way to to give the in an originian way also uh, to give the the reader the chance to choose. This I think this is something important. So can I, uh, just for a point of clarity, when you talk about the fragments, you're talking about fragments from uh, Jerome and Justinian, and I I can't remember if Epiphanius was included, certainly mm -hmm. Jerome and Justinian. Um, and so if you read like uh, Ketchow's uh, German edition and uh, G.W. Butterworth's English translation of it, you will see the fragments from Jerome and Justinian inserted into the text of origin. 
Uh, and this is the, the controversial issue because Justinian and Jerome, their fragments are trying to show to the readers uh, origins problematic positions. Mm -hmm. and whereas I, I think John Baird, doesn't he put those in like an appendix or something? He doesn't he take those out of the text itself and and put them into an appendix so readers have access to them, but they're not inserted into the text as if they're part of the original. Uh, I'm trying to remember, isn't that what Baird did? Mm. Yeah, this is the way. Also, the, Sus Chrétien yeah. put the, the, the fragments in a second volume. Okay. All right. Yeah, so if I could just jump in. So Yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah. You know, a few years ago, I did a lengthy review article in Jex of, I called it the modern editions of Perry Arcone. I think at, at least when I wrote it, I think there were nine editions. I, I can't remember. I have them on the screen here. See so if Jacques Merlin in 1512, then Charles de la Rue in 1733. And then you have Paul Kutchow, who really marks the beginning of a critical edition, um, 1913. And then we have Gergamans and Karp, which many of us have used, at least prior to Samuel, as sort of, it gets us into Kutchow. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have the Cruzel Simonetti edition, which Samuel referred to. We have the Catalonian translation, by Ruiz Camp. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, then we have Samuel Fernandez, and then the ninth is John Bears. Um, I put these into two big camps, and Samuel already referred to these. The first is those that present, they're an edition of Rufinus's translation, first and foremost. They present readers with Rufinus from beginning to end. So this is the first one by Merlon. This is the one by Cruzel and Simonetti. And this is the one by Bayer. So the first one, the last one, and one of the middle ones, they follow this strategy. And if you want to know what the other testimonies are, you have to look elsewhere in an appendix, in another volume, somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then you have the rest which present on the page where they think the relevant fragment lines up with what, what Rufinus offers you. Um, and so that's where you have Kutchow, that's where you have Gergamon and Karp, you have Samuel's edition. And I'm not just saying this because Samuel is here. Um, this is the preferable way. Um, because what all of these editions in the second camp do is they give you refinus. They don't suppress refinus. Even Kutchow does not suppress refinus. I mean, Kutchow's edition of Rufinus's translation is, I believe, the, the fundamental critical edition. Um, so what you as the reader want, I believe, is you want access to these other fragments so that you can jump in and make decisions. Whether you agree or disagree with the editor, you can at least see what other people were saying. Um, and I, I think that's preferable. Uh, where Ketchow got into some hot water, John, is, is uh, the way he formatted the left side of the page. He would put, he would intersperse Rufinus's translation with some of these other blocks reflecting his decisions. And if you didn't agree with him, that felt cumbersome that you'd have to skip over text. But Kutchow, nevertheless, still presents you all of Rufinus. And um, I think it's still regarded by most scholars in the field as the Editio Maior. So, even though they disagree with, I, there's two or three points where Ketchow makes a decision where people are like, no, um, the, these fragments are clearly not authentic. But it's not as if you can't figure out what Rufinus was saying there. It's all it's all there on Kutchow's page. I think part of the problem that English speakers have had is that Butterworth, who translated Kutchow into English, Butterworth often did not signal Kutchow's doubts. So Kutchow would put, beside some of his fragments, I can't remember if it was an asterisk or a footnote, but he would say, not so sure, not, not very confident. But Butterworth didn't bring that over into his English translation. And so the mm. English reader is given undue confidence in certain fragments that even Ketchow, like that Ketchow was trying to protect himself from. And so that's been part of the problem in the English speaking world 
is um, how Kutch has been mediated to us by Butterworth. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah I, 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 sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Samuel. Yeah. No, I, I think that I, I fully agree with, with Peter. I would say, if uh, simplifying a little bit things, uh, that Jerome's and Justinian fragments are all authentic. They cut in a uh, in a tricky way the fragments, but the fragments them, themselves are uh, are authentic, because uh, when you have a polemical um, environment, you also you 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 must be very careful in not modifying the fragments, otherwise you will be accused of uh, forgery and so on, and then. Uh, 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 Jerome and and also Justinian, when they cut the fragments, they cut carefully in a tricky way to show that Origen was a heretic. And sometimes uh, Origen was saying something like problematic, and they show that this was like a statement and so on. But the very text is trustworthy. Uh, when you put these fragments within the uh, Rufinus uh, translate, uh, transla Latin translation, many times you can understand better the, the meaning of the fragment. But there are other long fragments uh, included by Ketchow from uh, the Constantinople and uh, other authors which are not authentic, authentic at all. And then I fully agree with uh, with Peter that when you when you have the Butterworth translation, you think you are reading Origen, and sometimes you are you are not reading Origen. You are you are reading something very different from Origen. But I don't wish to cast a doubt uh, over uh, Jerome's and and Justinian fragments because I think that all are authentic. Can I jump in? Yep. The, yeah. Um, preparing for this. Um, so I I was trained in a very Cruzelian pro Rufinian regime. Okay, um, let's just leave it there. Uh, there is a wonderful example of where a fragment that comes from Justinian is certainly giving us the original origin better than Rufinus is uh, Book One. Chapter two, paragraph 13. One, two, 13. It's fragment six in Ketchow. And this is where Origen is discussing who can properly be called good, God and or the son. And Rufinus clearly collapses the text because when you compare it with Justinian, Justinian has, this is what Justinian says. He said, it would be right to say that he is an image of God's goodness but not goodness itself. And perhaps also the sun, while being good, is not yet good purely and simply. And just as he is the image of the invisible God, and in virtue of this is himself God, and yet he is, yet it is not he of whom Christ himself said that they may know thee, the only true God. So I, I garbled it a little bit here, but the idea is that goodness is properly attributed to God the Father. The sun is the image of goodness, not properly goodness. Well, every editor that I mentioned who tries to reconstruct the text, every editor thinks Justinian is right here. Mm -hmm. And they don't do it because they're pro-Justinian. They do it because we know from other Origenian texts mm -hmm. that he says this. We have it in the commentary on Matthew. We have it in the commentary on John, which survive in Greek. Mm -hmm. And so there's an excellent example in 1, 2, 13, of where you got to read Justinian, I think. Um, and Rufinus is the one who is trying to make Origen sound more orthodox for a late fourth century audience. Uh, and, you know, cut uh, Butterworth to his credit, gives it to oh, you. Yeah. Now it's right underneath Rufinus. I would be tempted if I were writing a translation to put the rough Rufinus in a footnote. Oh. Um. I would be tempted to like alert the reader that Rufinus said something else. But if we want to give someone a quick, just read the translation. This is what we think Origen said. I, I would I would embed Justinian there. 
um, and certainly not hide it. It's very unusual when scholars think the Justinian fragment there is authentic and they bury it in another book or an appendix. Oh. That only confuses the reader. It makes it so much yeah. harder too, because then you have to do extra work to get it. Whereas you keep I, it I, actually, I didn't I didn't check you, Samuel, on that, but I, I bet you, you I put the the I was yeah, I put within the text. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see if we can find Samuel here. It's a uh, page two hundred and four and and six. Is that where you go with the bold text? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, see, if you look at Samuel, he yeah. transitions right into Justinian's fragment, mm -hmm. cool. and and I and, and I, I suspect strongly that you have there in the footnotes a justification for why you've done this. Oh yeah, um, yeah. I say that I put the the fragment because Rufinus summarized the 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 text. Yep. Well, and in footnote 97, you, you refer to all these other passages in the commentary on John oh, and yeah. Matthew, where Origen says exactly what Justinian says Origen says. And like that yeah. to me is one of the big takeaways from all these conversations about editions is that we don't have to just say, well, we want to be Rofinian or we want to be Jerome's acolytes. We actually have a lot of other origin that we can use yeah. to triangulate. And because yeah. Origen does repeat himself. Yeah. And can I? I'm sorry, uh, uh, very, uh, very simple thing. Uh, it's something that I learned from uh, Emanuela Principali because between between Origen and Rufinus, we have Nicaea, which was a Trinitarian and Christological issue. And then Rufinus is very careful with the Trinitarian issues, but he has no problem at all with uh, anthropology. And then sometimes, for example, there are Greek texts of the Philokalia uh, that are modified to try to uh, avoid some problematic issues of origin, origins anthropology, and Rufinus uh, translate straight away the more problematic things because at the time of Rufinus, there were no anthropolo anthropological issues. We remember that even, for example, Augustine still thinks, well, we don't know the, the origin of the soul, and, and he put three theories and so on. And then this is a, a, an important key. That is, a Rufinus tried to modify origins Trinitarian theology, but not the anthropology, and then preexistence of souls and so on is clearly enough in, uh, in Rufinus. That's yeah. that's. That's a good point also, is just to remind us that just it's sometimes easy to think that the Philokalia is uh, that that's more authentic because it's Greek and it's oh. it's an excerpt from. But there are places where, yes, you have to go through finest. So you can't just make a language decision. Mm -hmm. Wow, we're going to go with whatever Greek survives because that's going to be clearly authentic. No, there are cases where the Greek is also misleading in the indirect tradition. Mm -hmm. Well, and at the end of the day, that's the big problem is that we don't have uh, on first principles in its full Greek original. So we are left with these uh, translation debates. And it's the the passage you selected there, that, that Trinitarian passage about, you know, whether the son can be called goodness itself or if that's appropriate just for the father. You know, that, that reminds me that, you know, when these translation debates were happening, you know, when, when Jerome and Rufinus were um, uh, uh, at war with each other, you know, on prayer, Origen's treatise on prayer was also embedded in a controversy roughly at the same time in the Egyptian desert. And one of the key problems that was presented there was in on prayer, Origen says, we don't pray to Christ. We pray to the Father, but through Christ. So there is that Trinitarian or, or Christological problem that Origen does not really seem to present a Nicene, uh, a pro-Nicene Christol or a pro-Nicene Trinitarian theology. Um, what? Is it, but this this gets to another uh, subject I was hoping to talk about today because he does talk about the relationship between the father and the son in on first principles. This is um, a very important topic in it. 
Can we talk a little bit about the structure of the text and some of the important thematic issues that Origen presents in it? So how, how would you guys classify the structure of the text? There's a, mm -hmm. it, itself a very complicated issue. No. Whichever one of you wants to take it away first. Peter, how about you this time? Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think that scholars, I, I'm, I have here on my other screen, um, the essay I referred to, um, rather than trying to speak off of memory here, um, I think most scholars recognize that there are two major cycles in the book. Um, the cycle one goes from the beginning to book two, section three, mm -hmm. and then origin comes back through the same cycle of topics, and each cycle is roughly structured according to the Articles of the Church's Rule. Second cycle, 2-4 to 4-3, and then there's a recapitulation in 4-4. Four, four. Mm -hmm. So he runs through the subject matter twice. And, and people have argued that you know, there are different emphases when he goes through these cycles. Uh, I think the fact that he comes through two cycles might suggest a classroom setting, as Samuel mentioned at the very beginning of our talk. Is this a professor who was working through something one time and then stops and thinks about it and says, ah, there's another way to do it and let's do it again. Um, so two major cycles with a recapitulation at the end. The four book structure, there I must defer to the editor who can tell us more about why we have four books. Because Samuel worked, it's, well, it's one of the strengths of Samuel's edition is he spent a lot of time on the divisions and chapter headings. Um, no scholar prior to Samuel did that. So maybe, Samuel, you can help us out a little bit with that. Mm. Yeah, well, uh, <clears throat> my impression is uh, that the the pedagogy, the pedagogical approach is like the, the key to understand for understanding the the. Um, the relationship between the two cy cycles that uh, Peter mentioned. Because, for example, views uh, both have a different character. Uh, I would say that the first one is more speculative and the second one is more biblical and more, so to say, ecclesiastical. Mm -hmm. And then this is like the opposite than uh, we think, because if I today in a parish, I have to, to deal with students, I start with the more ecclesiastical and more biblical issues and then the more speculative. But Origen was not in a parish, but he was in the school and a school in which the, the, the addressees, the auditorium, were, was uh, made by a Greek educated people. And then my idea is that origin has to deal first with the with more speculative way, the same issues, to show to these Greek educated people that Christianity is not silly. That is, we can speculate about the... And then origin, what is the first topic? God is not corporeal. And then... A Platonic guy who was in Alexandria and was interested in Christianity, uh, his friend told them why you are going to approach Christianity because they think that God is like a, a bodily God and so on. And then he arrived to origin and the first what and, and, and he heard that God is according to origin, God is spiritual, God is not material and so on. And then the, the first cycle is it is like to to show that Christianity is not a silly uh, faith, but is something that is subject to rational investigation. And when once they were uh, convinced that this is something uh, valuable, uh, then uh, he started the second circle cycle, uh, which was more anti-heretic, was more biblical, and more so to say, ecclesiastical. And this is a, an idea that I read in, in uh, Brian Daly, 
uh, he has a very good uh, essay on the structure of the on first principle and but I, at the end he he dealt with the with the scripture because uh, origin didn't want to to look like uh, like a fideistic uh, group we start to say that this is an inspired book and you have to believe that well this is not the first step for a greek educated people they have to understand that this there is something valuable uh, which has the same uh, title of many other uh, philosophical books that is we are dealing with the big questions of human mind and then by the end he can uh, present the scripture and show the coherence between the scripture and this uh, big picture that he has uh, transmitted to the students. Mm -hmm. This is more or less the the my idea about the about the the the, the structure. Yeah. Well, the way you described book one, because book one it, it starts right away with. Um, and we have this in Rufinus's translation where the, the problem is how do we understand the word incorporeal, right? I mean, isn't that the thing that starts the whole the whole discussion? Uh, mm -hmm. And Origen is trying to grapple with what does it mean to be incorporeal? Does that mean um, a, a spirit that still might possess matter, uh, actual stuff? Or is it something that is that does not possess any stuff? And that's like the first question that that's kind of where I mentioned at the very beginning, there seems to be a division in this text uh, into different philosophical subjects. And that would seem to fit into like a traditional um, lecture course on physics that you might get in like a Platonic Academy or something like that. But then there's also ethics, right? Uh, in book three, I mean, this is one of the more important uh, texts in it. Uh, passed down to us in the Greek, where Origen is talking about free will. Um, what are what are some of the other subjects? I mean, we've got the the um, uh, the resurrection of the body, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have the, the, there is this God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then the rational creatures, and afterward the, the world, and this two times, and finally the, the recapitulation, the, the scripture and recapitulation. Scripture and recapitulation, right. But the, like all all of these issues, like so, so that the sun and the spirit are individual existences, is a major theme at the beginning. Um, this is an anti-monarchian stance. The incorporeal incorporeality of God. This is an issue that we know is a majority view among Christians in his day. So Origen is taking up a position on that. Yeah, a whole host of soul questions. Yeah. How they originate, how they fall, where do they go? Mm -hmm. um, and a really strident defense, not of biblical interpretation, but of the symbolic interpretation of the law and prophets. That's really the focus, is justifying a symbolic reading. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the observations Ronald Heine made several years ago in reading the preface so in the preface origin says uh, when he comes to this issue of the scriptures he says uh, on this point the entire church is unanimous that while the whole law is spiritual the inspired meaning is not recognized by all but only by those who are gifted by the grace of the holy spirit and ron heine said well that's kind of an overstatement. <laughs> and, and I would argue that's precisely the point. Origin, we know from Origin's surviving homilies that he gets heckled when he allegorizes. The people, the, the people move the, move the head. Yep. 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 They yep. don't like it. We know that people on the ground don't like the symbolic interpretation of the law and prophets. And Origin, when he defends the view in the fourth book, he does something that I think is unusual for him. He resorts to hyperbole. There are thousands of other passages that are like this, that are impossible, irrational, that we have to read symbolically. And Origen says this a few times. There are thousands of other passages. Now, that's an exaggeration. Yep. 
We know from Origen's surviving homilies and commentaries that that's an exaggeration. But the fact that he exaggerates is, I think, something that we should pay attention to as careful readers. Why is he exaggerating? Why does he insert into the church's rule a statement on scripture needing to be allegorized? That's not a position that was well known. So that tells you how nervous he is about his own project for reading and how he has to find a way to not only get it into the rule when he gets pushed by people about defending why he reads this way, he produces a dossier of Pauline texts. He, he does this repeatedly in his corpus where he stops and he says, well, what about this passage? And what about this passage? All these places where in the Pauline letter correspondence, Paul is doing something like this, spiritual reading from there to here. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, this becomes a really big issue in his, um, let's say, before the home crowd is, is defending this way of reading the text. Um, that's what makes, I think, the fourth book so interesting. It's really your first extended treatise in the Christian tradition that, that defends symbolic reading and why it's important. And he even lays down a code for how to read symbolically. And he tells you, whenever you see this word, Jerusalem, you can think this or that. Whenever you see this word, Israel, you can think this or that. So he's giving people a code for reading Old Testament narratives symbolically. Um and this all comes out of the home context, real anxiety about what he's doing. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I think we just went full circle right there, all the way back to the to the very beginning uh, <laughs> of this conversation. Um, and I think it does make sense of why, because when you read his uh, rule of faith at the, in the preface, you wonder, why does he say anything in here about the allegorical or spiritual interpretation of scripture. What does this have to do with the rule of faith? And then why does he include uh, three chapters of the fourth book dedicated to how do we read the scriptures in a text that you wouldn't anticipate that coming uh, if you read it from the very beginning. Uh, and so it, it does seem to give some coherence to the whole project as a defense of his spiritualized interpretation of the biblical text. Something which, mm -hmm. he, yeah, I mean, he says it in his homilies frequently, like in the psalm homilies, there are a couple of instances where he talks about people who are sick and tired of his allegorizing, but he says, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. We take this uh, at face value. It's it's a ridiculous reading. Right. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so, last yeah, question. I, oh, I'm sorry, Sammy, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, well, uh, about what you said about coherence and and taking also some ideas from, from Peter. Um I would say that one of the main features of the of on first principle, more than a, a particular uh, subject, is the, the this idea of coherence. The the because coherence is the opposite of irrationality, random, and so on. And then um, I think that it is possible to to find three elements uh, uh, which give us. Uh, unity of uh, origins thinking and the first one is the coherence of the doctrinal body uh, he stated that at, at by the end of the of the of the preface he says that this whole body is coherent which is a novelty because in roman religion you 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 don't have to 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 show that your religion is coherent in, in a rational way but no but christianity is coherent the second thing is that uh, this coherence uh, goes together with the coherence of the scripture. But to say that there is coherence in the scripture uh, is something that you can only say if you are allowed to, uh, to understand symbolically the scripture. Because if you read in a literal way the scripture, scripture is not coherent. And then... Uh, this coherence also uh, becomes like a, a criterion to understand, to identify the, the right uh, understanding of the scripture. Because as far as you are uh, having a picture of this, this big picture of the coherence of Christian thinking, then with this idea, you can read the scripture and you can uh, identify what is coherent with the 
the whole. And obviously the scripture uh, in like in a hermeneutic circle is uh, modifying your, uh, your, your picture, but there is a, an interaction between the coherence of the scripture and the coherence of the system. And if we go to the, to the, to the very text of origin, he says, in the by by the end of the preface he says that uh, we have to look for the truth of each particular uh, statement that is there is no coherence in the level of the letter but in the truth of the letter which is this uh, symbolic uh, idea and the the, the last uh, point is that origin also he is aware of his own ignorance there is a a beautiful statement in which he say, we uh, we are not unaware of our ignorance. We are not ignorant of our ignorance. Uh, and then this system of origin is not a closed system, but it's an open system because of our ignorance. And then uh, this, uh, this is a systematic in the sense that he uh, is convinced that the whole reality is possible to be thought by with, with the light of, of faith. And on the other hand, uh, this coherence doesn't mean that we know everything, but there are many uh, issues that we don't know, but we know that they must be coherent with the whole uh, with the whole picture. Okay, so, Last question. <laughs> this is this is like a legacy kind of question here. To, at least in North America, we, we we're seeing this um, growth in great books programs, where young men and women are getting introduced to some of the great texts of the Western canon: Plato, Aristotle, Augustine. Uh, Dante, Shakespeare, so on and so forth. Does On First Principles belong on the reading list of a great books program? If not, what place would you give it in the history of uh, Western civilization? Um, whichever one of you wants to take it first, um, uh, Samuel, let's start with you. Well, uh, well, obviously, I, I think that it's a, it's worth to to be in this in this canon, in the sense that it's a, it's a text that, first of all, is um, is open to dialogue. That is, it's not a dogmatic issue that you have to believe or go or go away, like uh, the idea of Celsus. But uh, it's, a, it's a text in which you can dialogue and you can disagree with origin, and origin is open to, 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 to this. And then I think, first of all, the, this is something uh, very important uh, to, to, to show that this is a, a, a book that is open to dialogue. And the second thing is that we we could discuss a lot about the influence of this uh, book in our culture. Uh, I remember when uh, this Pixar movie, Soul, uh, appeared, Peter Martins, uh, you commented something about the, in Facebook or so, but many issues, even in the in the cartoons, the the the, the angel and the devil oh, yeah. trying to convince you and so on. Many things of this are uh, comes from the from on on first principle and this issue of the preexistence of souls and so on uh, are are present in our like in our culture and are developed for the first time extensively in on first principle. Oh. Yeah, so. Um, I had wanted this book to make a presence in Princeton University Press's series, Lives of Great Religious Books. Oh. I don't know if you recall this series. I don't know if it's still running, but it's about great religious texts and their afterlives. And I 
I really wanted On First Principles to make it into that series because of its afterlife, to which Samuel just alluded. This is a text that raises fascinating questions about translation, about editorial work, and how do you deal with a text that has such a fragmentary history and that is still important. So it raises all kinds of questions about how texts survive and get reimagined over the centuries. Um, I like Samuel's answer here that this is a text that gives us important firsts. I would add a very powerful statement on human freedom, the capacity mm -hmm. to make decisions for which you are accountable. Yep. Extremely important text for that purpose, to say nothing of other issues where it's an important first step. Mm -hmm. um, I like the fact that it's a text that is paradoxical. It's anchored in a rule of faith, but yet it's very open-ended in the questions that it asks. Mm -hmm. um, I like the fact that it's a text about principles, but it also has narratives. It's the narrative of Jesus. It's the narrative of the soul returning to God. And there's also autobiographical clues about Origen's own story that are built into this. Um, it's a text that is very ironic. I mean, Origen is defending himself against critics, but it becomes the text by which he's condemned. So uh, there's just so many points in which readers can engage this text, um, whether it's asking their own religious questions or thinking about how others have wrestled with the text, but it's just not clean and simple. There's always a point in which you can engage it and have a meaningful debate about it. And... Um, so, yeah, I th I think it's a text that merits reading by lots of people. Um, whether it's the best text to start with for reading Origin, I don't know. I don't know. Probably isn't a best text. It's it it's a demanding text, but I think it rewards all kinds of readers. Well, I agree. And and I would say um, because of the ideas it presents and because it presents them in such a dialectical way, you know, Origen has this wonderful way of writing that uh, I believe Pamphilus even spoke about in his apology, that people struggle reading Origen because they don't know, you know when he's putting up multiple hypotheses and testing them, he doesn't always answer the question which hypothesis he finds most plausible. So it's almost like the reader is getting um, a crash course in dialectics, uh, learning how to propose hypotheses and to try and uh, test them. Uh, that's all over in first principles. Um, also, Peter, your point about translation, I mean, it would be a wonderful text for translators to engage and think about how to best go about doing the work of translation and the problems that are involved in it, uh, just because of the reasons you outline. That's a that's another reason why I think it should be more widely read. Um, but I think the name of the text on first principles, you know, and he outlines the first principles of a Christian philosophy, and I think for the first time in a in a very comprehensive manner which I, I do think warrants placement on, you know, a, a great books reading list. Because uh, as, as you guys said, you can read these, you can read the first principles that Origen is outlining, and you can disagree with, you know, what he says. This is a very open-ended, you know, research-based program that Origen is presenting. And he'll often say, uh, you know, I don't know the best answer to this. Uh, if you guys have a, have a, a better answer, uh, more power to you, stick to it. Um, I'm giving you options to choose from. Uh, it's a, such a fascinating text. And it's too bad that we don't have it in its original Greek, because um, oftentimes I think the discussions of its ideas get bogged down in issues of translation and, and reception. Um, but even those issues have presented scholars with great opportunities for fantastic conversations, just like this one here. So I, I really hope you guys have uh, enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. I hope the listeners enjoy it as much as I have, and I hope they've learned a lot like I have. Samuel and Peter, thank you very much for a, a wonderful conversation on Patristicast. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, John. Great. Till next time, I'm your host, John Solheide, and hope you guys have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.